Um, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Rennie. Thanks for having me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. What a lovely gathering of the tribe, of the family. It's, um, it's really lovely. Um, so, yep, my name's Liam Prince, and I'm the director of the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies, otherwise known to posterity and the universe as the teachers. Um, I'm speaking to you this afternoon from the University of Western Australia, um, which is located on Wajak Noongar land. Um, I'm here today to deliver what I hope will be a message of hope uh, and of uplift uh, and a call to action. Um, I'm here today, Teachers is here today um, as the direct result of previous uh, Australian government policy choices and public investment in Asian language education. Um, as you all know, as a country, we, Australia, uh, have done Asian language education better, um, well even in the past. Uh, and I'm here to say that we could do it better again in the future if we chose as a country to do so. But we are in a hole. Um, there's been no coordinated national plan involving uh, Commonwealth and state governments for the teaching of Asian languages in Australian schools since the winding up of NAUSP, the National Asian Languages and Studies in Schools program, uh, a decade ago in 2012. Uh, and there's been no substantial or consistent government funding uh, available to incentivise Australian schools to teach Asian languages since the end of uh, NAUSP and properly since the end of NAUSIS, the National Asian Languages and Studies in Australian Schools Strategy in 2002. You're going to have to forgive all the acronyms. It is obviously, you guys are probably well versed in it, but it's, it's, a, it's a peril of discussing uh, this particular uh, area of public policy. Can I get a thumbs up? Can everybody hear me? I'd hate to be telegraphing to the void. Can I get a verbal? Yes. Yes, good. Thanks, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so there's very, as I see it, um, very little supporting the study of Asian languages uh, in Australian schools and universities at present beyond the small, and, and it has to be said, shrinking communities of dedicated educators and enthusiasts in each state and territory, among whose honoured number I definitely count myself. Um, the, these communities themselves are largely vestiges of public policy interventions and investments of public funding made between the mid-1990s and the early 2000s. Yeah, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Are you sharing yeah. your screen? Uh, I'm, I will in a, just a tick. Oh, okay. You haven't, yeah. you haven't you have to, you have to look, sorry. You have, to, yeah. you have to look at my mug for just a little bit longer and then I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll kick, then I'll kick over to the, um, to the slides. Um, yeah, uh, so where was I? Yeah, so after that decade of neglect, it's not surprising that the teaching and learning of Asian languages and Indonesian most acutely in Australia is at a historically low level. The present isn't entirely bleak. Um, we do have the new Colombo plan. The NCP, as it's otherwise known, is an Australian government program that has, since its establishment eight years ago, uh, invested uh, about $320 million into encouraging Australian undergraduate students to study abroad in the Indo-Pacific. Now, this is a, a really significant investment of public funding in Australia's Asia literacy and, albeit indirectly, Asian language education. For, for comparison, the Commonwealth spend on the NCP to date is about the same amount of money that the Australian government spent on the entirety of NALSIS over its eight year lifespan between 95 and 2002, or about $337 million in today's terms. So now I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Let's see if I can pull this off. Can I get a verbal? Yeah. I can see the slides. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. All right, give me a moment. So today, I want to talk to you about the future by talking to you about the past, and particularly about the three most recent historical high points of Australian government investment in Asian language literacy: NAUSIS, NAUSP, and the NCP. So. NAUSIS. What was NAUSIS? NAUSIS was the National Asian Languages and Studies in Australian Schools Strategy, and it was launched in 1995. It was targeted at a national Australian school population of approximately 3.1 million students as of 1995. 
the scheme provided Australian government funding to primary and secondary schools for the establishment of language programs in four priority Asian languages, Japanese, uh, Mandarin Chinese, Indonesian, and Korean. In total, over its eight year lifespan, as I said, the Australian government spent well, $207 million on NALSIS, or in today's terms, $337 million. Uh, peak annual Commonwealth expenditure on NALSIS was $30 million per annum or $49 million in today's money, uh, which equates roughly to a peak spend of about $18 per Australian school student per annum on Asian language literacy. So what did NALSIS do? In its first three years between 95 and 97, NALSIS increased the number of government schools in Australia offering a priority Asian language by 44% from 2,600 schools nationally in 94 to 3,700 schools in 1997. It increased the number of students at government schools studying a priority Asian language by 60% from 324,000 students nationally in 94 to 518,000 students uh, in 1997. This is a really remarkable achievement in just three years. There's, there's evidence that this breakneck growth in the numbers of, the, of school programs and student enrolments was, wasn't sustained in the latter years of NALSIS, but these first three years of the scheme are testament to how quickly enrolment numbers can be turned around with adequate government funding. Reflecting on it in a speech delivered in 2005, the then Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and key architect of NALSIS, Kevin Rudd, described the program like this. He said that it was a fusion of political and bureaucratic willpower which came together to transform it from a strategy uh, into a reality. Now, unfortunately, it was a fusion of willpower that didn't last very long. Um, Commonwealth funding for NALSIS was cut at the end of 2002, a decision that led Rudd to write the following in a letter to the then Commonwealth Minister for Education, Brendan Nelson. I'll just let you read that while I just uh, have a drink. So um, after a six year hiatus, uh, NALSIS was partially resuscitated uh, in 2009 in the form of the National Asian Languages and Studies in Schools Program, or as I said, NALSP. <coughs> NALSP was launched in 2009, and it was in effect that further quadrennium of NALSIS that Rudd spoke of in his letter to Brendan Nelson, albeit delayed <coughs> by, by six years. Um, NAUSP was targeted at an Australian school population of now 3.5 million students nationally as of 2009, and the scheme once again provided government funding to Australian schools to establish and deliver programs in the same four priority Asian languages, Japanese, Mandarin, Indonesian and Korean. In total, over its four-year lifespan, the Australian government spent $62 million on NAUSP or $74 million in today's terms. Um, but peak annual Commonwealth expenditure on NAUS was only half what it was under NAUS. It's roughly $15 million a year, or on a per capita basis, so about $6 per Australian school student per annum. And what did NAUS do? Well, we don't know. Um, the program was discontinued in 2012, and there doesn't appear to have been yet a comprehensive review of the impact of NAUSP in terms of the number of Australian school students studying and schools teaching the designated priority Asian languages, at least not a review that I could find that was publicly available. If such a doc document does exist and any of you uh, know about it, can, can you let me know? Because I'd love to read it. Um, if we plot then Australian government funding for, for Asian language education in schools um, on a graph, it, uh, we get this two humped camel looking shape, which traces the Commonwealth government's fitful and waning enthusiasm for, for funding the goal of broad-based uptake of Asian languages by Australian school students. The, the graph clearly illustrates the peril and the difficulty of trying to prosecute a long-term national project that doesn't enjoy bipartisan support. So I'd like now to illustrate to you the impact of NAUSIS and NAUSP and their subsequent disestablishment by looking at the teaching and learning of Indonesian at year 12 level in two states, 
uh, Victoria and Western Australia. First Victoria, whoops, here we go. So here are the annual Victorian VCE enrolments uh, in Indonesian for the period 1994 to 2001. Uh, this is what I was able to, to get from the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority, um, but that gives us a good close to almost 30 year timeline. Um, Under Nausis, between 95 and 2002, annual VCE Indonesian enrolments grew rapidly and continuously, more than doubling from 493 enrolments in 1995 to a peak of 1,061 enrolments in 2002. During the six-year hiatus in Commonwealth funding between the end of Nausis and the launch of NAUSP, annual VCE Indonesian enrolments dropped by 33% um, to just 713 students in 2009. Enrolments rallied slightly in 2010, the second year of NAUSP, but overall it appears that NAUSP had a negligible impact on year 12 Indonesian enrolments in Victoria. In WA, uh, we don't have year 12 data for the first three years of NAUSP. Uh, I was I, unable to get that from the curriculum authority here in WA, but um, picking up the story from 1998, uh, we see a huge 68% uh, increase in annual year 12 Indonesian enrolments in the latter years of NAUSAS. Uh, from 208 students in 1999 to a peak of 350 students in 2001. Numbers are already beginning to decline steeply during the final year of NAUSAS before cratering catastrophically during the six year hiatus between NAUSAS and NAUSP, um, falling to just 60 students in 2009. Enrolments then rally modestly under the second and third years of NAUSP uh, before declining again in the program's final year. Uh, as for the number of secondary schools teaching Indonesian at year 12 level, uh, in Victoria, uh, there were 37 Victorian high schools teaching Indonesian at year 12 level in 1995. Uh, by the end of um, NAUSIS, this number has grown to 103 schools and numbers actually peak, uh, peaked three years after the end of NAUSIS in 2005 with 116 Victorian high schools teaching Indonesian at year 12 VCE level. Uh, that's almost a tripling of numbers over 10 years. Numbers then decline between 2006 and 2009. Uh, once again, as, with, as was the case for year 12 enrolments, um, NAUSP appears to have had a negligible impact on the number of schools teaching Indonesian in Victoria. Um, interestingly, the number of secondary schools in Victoria teaching Indonesian at year 12 level has never so far dipped back below pre nausis levels, which suggests that NAUSIS was delivering of some lasting infrastructure and communities of educators in Victoria. As of 2021, there were 62 Victorian schools offering Indonesian at year 12 uh, VCE level. Uh, in WA, the number of schools teaching Indonesian at year 12 level peaked two years after the end of NAUSIS in 2004 at 30 schools. Um, between 2005 and the second year of NAUSP in 2010, this number fell to just 13 schools. Uh, numbers rallied a little during the final two years of NAUSP and actually grew to a peak of 18 schools in 2013, one year after the discontinuation of NAUSP. As of 2021, there were 12 WA schools offering Indonesian at year 12 ATAR level. So I'd like to turn now to the new Colombo plan. Um, Okay, um, the new Colombo plan or NCP was launched in 2014. For those of you playing at home, that was two years after the disestablishment of NAUSP. But you know, this is in keeping with my theory that we're never allowed two nice things at the same time. From, uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so that, 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 that was the timeline of it. Uh, it's targeted, uh, the NCP is targeted at a national Australian domestic undergraduate population of approximately 800,000 students. As of, you know, 2022. Um, the scheme provides Australian government funding to domestic undergraduate students to support study and internships in 40 Indo-Pacific destination countries. 
Interestingly though, 70% of NCP mobility program funding, which is one half of, if not more of the overall NCP, um, has been focused on just nine, uh, during the period 2019 to 2022, has been focused on just nine of these 40 destinations. So that's Indonesia, and this is in order of funding over, the, over that, that span, Indonesia, India, Japan, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Fiji, Malaysia, and South Korea. So those nine destinations accounting for taking up 70% of that funding. Uh, in total so far over its eight year lifespan, the Australian government has spent uh, 322 million on the NCP. Peak annual Commonwealth expenditure on the NCP so far has been $54 million during the 2017-18 fiscal year, which equates roughly to a peak spend of about $67 per Australian domestic undergraduate student per annum. So the NCP is a much more expensive program on a per student basis than was either NAUSIS at $18 a student or NAUS at $6 a student due to its targeting of a much smaller student population. That is 800,000 undergraduates, domestic undergraduates versus 4 million school students. So what has the NCP done? In its first six years, between 2014 and 2019, the NCP has increased the number of Australian domestic undergraduates studying in the Indo-Pacific annually by 83%, from 8,500 students in 2014 to 15,500 students in 2019. It's nearly doubled the number of Australian undergraduates studying in Indonesia and India each year, and nearly tripled the numbers studying in Vietnam and Malaysia. And these are those achievements represented uh, graphically. And you know, I've got one that's just, just Indonesia. Okay, so um, that's the past uh, and the current state of play. NAUSIS, NAUSP uh, and the NCP. As the country, uh, these are the high watermarks, uh, our greatest hits, if you like, in terms of public funding for the project of building Australia's Asia literacy, all to some extent illustrating the rapid national system-wide progress that can be made, and I would argue only made, through adequate government funding. Um, Government funding isn't in and of itself sufficient to turn around, I don't believe, the current downward trend in Asian language learning in Australia, but history tells us it is a, it's a necessary condition. Any Australian government intent on seriously moving the needle on the number of students studying Asian languages at Australian schools and universities would at minimum uh, need to restore public funding to something like the level that prevailed under NAUSIS between 95 and 2002, that is about $71 million per year. So where to from here? What do we do now? Well, here's what I reckon. We need to create a national working group to begin drafting successor legislation to NAUSIS. Uh, for want of a, a better name yet, we could call it NAUSIS 2.0. I think we need to rally around the argument for reinstatement of funding for Asian language literacy of $18 per Australian school student per annum the level that prevailed previously under NAUSIS. We need to secure a total funding commitment of $71 million per annum from a combination of Commonwealth and state and territory governments. Uh, it could look something like this. We could get lucky and get the Commonwealth government to fund the entire thing. Um, if the Commonwealth government isn't coming to the party, then we could try a state and territory based approach, uh, which might look something like this. Or perhaps we could convince the Commonwealth and state and territory governments to split the cost of analysis 2.0, in which case it would look something like this. So many options. In conclusion, let me stop sharing this.
we've done Asian language literacy in this country much better than we're currently doing. The good news is that we know how to do this and we can do it again. We have historical precedent. We have the corporate memory. We still have many of the people who designed and implemented NAUSIS and NAUSP. I think we need to dust off our notes, sharpen our proposals and be ready to hit the ground running for when the wheel turns and we see a realignment of that political and bureaucratic willpower behind the project of building Australia's Asia literacy. If the wheel isn't turning on its own, then I think those of us who are inclined to need to put our shoulders to it and push. The next time that we're presented with a politician, be they a Kevin Rudd or a, a Julie Bishop, who, who wishes to sink personal political capital into this long-term national project, we need to be ready with properly thought out, properly costed draft legislation. Draft legislation that has broad support from relevant sectors and constituencies with wrinkles and conflicts already ironed out as best they can be and with considerable consensus support already consolidated behind it. As it is, but we might have missed our window of opportunity to do this preparatory work in advance of the next political cycle, if indeed there's a change of government in, in May. My point is though, there's no time like the present. We do not want to miss our next big chance at this because history shows that it could be another decade or two before it comes around again. Thank you, that's all from me. I look forward to our Q&A session and I'll hand over to Melissa. Uh, so, what? so let's turn over uh, to questions. Can I can I, we, I, oh, um, <laughs> and has been all raised uh, hand. So maybe um, can we unmute? I can unmute myself, I think. Oh, you can unmute yourself? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Like, Thank, um, Thank you. Uh, thanks to both speakers. And um, <laughs> that was scary. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks to both speakers. And um, uh, I wish I dressed more formally now. Um, <laughs> Uh, we can probably unspotlight you. Can we um, <laughs> do a general? Yeah. Like, I'll fix yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, both great talks. I won't, I won't address my question to Melissa because we've been chatting separately about this stuff. Um, but for Liam, and I think, well, one thing you know is that with the AA is doing this big report, it's taken a while, but I think I totally agree that we just need to put the idea of a NALSAS style or scale intervention back on the agenda. Um, like, was it last year? You know, DFAT is doing this review of Australia Indonesia relations, and one of the things that came up was language. And, and some of the people doing that review were of the opinion, well, you know, it's not really a federal government responsibility, and what can the federal government do to affect? And they'd never heard of NALSA. So for us, it's very sort of fresh and something that is this sort of legend in our world. But there's a lot of policymakers and other people out there who just never heard of it. So I think just hammering away that there was this thing that had an effect um, is really important. So I totally agree with you on all of that. Um, the second question, though, is a bit more specific. So we know that NALSA had all these various components, like there was provision, there was investment in like curriculum development, teacher training, and I think there were incentives to schools as well and so on. So as well as just pointing out that, yes, we need this scale of investment, do we know much about which particular interventions actually had the most effect? Because I haven't really okay. seen much on that. That's the question. Thanks, Ed. I think you look lovely. Um, Thank you. I, I don't know is the short answer. I, I mean, I've read a couple of the write-ups of NALSIS. There's a good, uh, the, there was a good report done in after the first quadrennium uh, by uh, oh, Caracas, what's his name? The guy who headed up the NALSIS steering committee, Colin Macaris, sorry, uh, from Griffith. Uh, and that's great. That's where those stats about what it achieved came from. And it talks about what worked, what didn't. In short, I don't know what aspects it did. I know what I think. <laughs> what we're lacking in the system right now that happens. We need, we need some financial incentives, funding, a pot of funding that is available at a school level because the decision makers that we need to reach are the school heads, the principals, the people that manage a school balance sheet, that manage a school budget. They need a pot of money they can apply for um, to take a risk, to take a chance and to add an Asian language to the roster. Because at the moment without that, 
those school heads are subject to the PNC meetings. And, and I know from my own, you know, the school up the road that I'm sending our, our kids to, um, at the moment, without a pot of money that can subsidise that risk taking, um, then uh, Indonesians not going to get up, right? The whole national language languages at a school uh, at a school level operates like a first past the post electoral system, where only the majority voice gets heard, right? So, and the majority voice at most schools is French, right? French should be the language that should be studied. Now, that's fine. I think we need to, any future study, we have to reassure the, you know, the North Shore Sydney private schools or the Western suburbs here in Perth that we're not coming, we're not coming for your French programs. By all means, <laughs> learn French, keep learning French, it's great. But why not, why, but why, why not also, why not also add Indonesian? And hey, there's this pot of money to subsidise doing so, because I know at a school level, once there's choice for the children and parents, there will be a small minority minority constituency for not French or French and Indonesian, you know, but we need, you need a way of having that choice at a school level because school kids, even more than university kids are immobile, right? They're not going to up and go to the school down the road because it offers Mandarin or very few kids are, very few parents are. So that's, that's the element of analysis that I think we need to replicate, whether that's from federal funding or, or, or from state funding. Right. Uh, Melissa, chip in if you want to, uh, to add anything. All, all I was just going to say is when I was looking at your graph, Liam, I realised I was teaching Indonesian in a primary school in 2003 and 2004, which was actually when it finished. But because it was in Victoria, I think that school got Victorian state government funding at the time. So it would be interesting to... Um, uh, Joe Lobianco has a report on uh, language learning in Victoria and sort of pushes the Victorian model, if you like, as a possible uh, model that other states could adopt. And it would be interesting to kind of look at the federal government and then Victoria and, you know, whether it's filled the gaps. I'll just add, sorry, um, thanks, Melissa, but I think I think also once you have that money, again, I want to emphasize it, it isn't just about the money, but it is a necessary condition. Once you have that quantum of funding that schools directly can access and to take a chance and to add a program, what Nelsus clearly did was build an ecosystem, right? In which things like, I don't know, a teacher's could be born, right? Or or curriculum could be born, or, you know, um, you know the work that David Reeve and, um, and Julia Reed, Julie Reed did about building curriculum. It's why Vilta is as strong as it is, right? It's because it, it incubated those creations. And it wasn't necessarily that they were directly funded by Nelsus, but they were an indirect result of that quantum of funding being injected into this particular endeavor. Great. Um, uh, quickly, yeah, I think there is Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Well, Lucy, lovely to see you. The Consul General from Perth, uh, WA. Uh, please ask your question. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharon, uh, and everyone, Ibu Melissa and Pak Liam. That was a really good uh, presentation. And hello, everyone. I'm Listy. Uh, I'm, I'm the Consul General in, in uh, WA. And I'm sorry to uh budging in like this but i'm i'm quite new in, in learning uh the the ropes and challenges in terms of, of promoting bahasa indonesia I, I'm, I'm learning a little bit just a very simple question has there been any any uh uh, uh pulling perhaps pulling or i don't know what you call it pulling among the uh, general australian the general public on well, how do, do they see Bahasa Indonesia? Is it really something that they want to learn? Just like Liam explained, uh, the majority in certain school will be the one who will win which language. And obviously we don't compete between languages. We have to learn as many languages as possible. I think one of the uh, the participants on the chat box also said this, and I agree completely. But uh, what interest actually in, in the Australian gender uh, toward Indonesia? Uh, uh, whether to uh, have a bit of uh, bahasa to go to Bali, is that more than that? Or is there any any pooling or something, questionnaire sending out to, to everyone? Maybe when you go to Woolworths or somewhere else, not, not, not to school, but you know, the general public, if, if, if the interest is there, if this is the, the, what they want. And maybe we can also, uh, if there is any such as data, perhaps uh, our role at the uh, embassies Concerts will also be included. Uh, I know uh, there's no uh, Indonesian government to to uh, to give funding uh, in in that sense, but we can collaborate after we ex exactly know what we are going to uh, we are going up against. Uh, well, yeah. 
that that's just a simple question. I'm sorry about the simple question, but thank you so much, Ms. Sharon, for this. Thank you. Brian or Melissa, do you want to jump in with any thoughts? Do you want to go? You want to have a crack? Um, thanks, Bulisti. Thank you for the question. Um, look, I think we have to be honest and say that um, there's not a lot of organic demand for learning Indonesian uh, in the Australian population, uh, and there hasn't been uh, historically. Um, so any government intervention historically has been ahead of where the Australian population is. I think it's just a reality. Um, now, I mean, we've talked, uh, Bulisti, and, and some of our conversations about what, what, what could be done, and I think I said kind of flipply that the best thing that the Indonesian government could be to do would be to keep supporting you know netflix and spotify to kind of create all that beautiful cultural content coming through now uh which might change that um uh, and that wouldn't be that that certainly wouldn't hurt the cause but i still don't think that uh, more cultural cachet uh or cultural prestige behind indonesian in and of itself would be enough to to see those numbers like in terms of enrollments change that much because we have the counterfactual actually we have it in korean um, like Koreans having a real uh, cultural moment, right, in the West yeah. and, and, and in yeah. Australia. Now, that we would, I mean, I've talked with uh, colleagues here in Korean studies, you know, joking, we would kill for that kind of cultural prestige and, uh, over in Indonesian studies. And she said to us, well, we would kill for your networks and kind of established um, infrastructure, right? Yeah. So I think, yeah. I think, I think you, it's, it's, it's not enough. Like it would help, but it, again, if you wanted to make, systemic change around actually increasing enrollments in schools and also yeah, the then culture. by extension universities you would also <laughs> then need significant funding injection from somewhere and, and 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 historically that's been from the commonwealth government but some combination of the commonwealth and state governments or yeah. i could say look we could just give up <laughs> the alternative is right we just accept that the notion of a broad-based uptake of asian languages and indonesian in particular was always a pipe dream and it's now a busted flush, right? Like, <laughs> right? But I, I mean, I mean you I, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, I mean, I am, I am, I am occupationally, professionally biased. But I'm, I'm personally not ready to give up yet, right? Like, because I think it, it, it's still really important. Like, I know. Uh, sorry, I've, I'll wrap it on. I'll, I'll wrap up. But that, that, you know, last year we celebrated uh, the appointment of our first female uh, am, am Australian ambassador to. Uh, Indonesia in Penny Williams, right? And at the time of her appoint appointment, we all celebrated the fact that she had a working fluency in Indonesian, a professional level fluency in Indonesian. I did too. Mm. Wonderful progress. Isn't that great? But why wasn't it the case before? Like, how how is that remarkable? Like, why is that remarkable? Like, like don't we want to live? Don't we want to live in a world where that is? unremarkable like i don't understand anyway like it, it reminded me a little bit of like when we had our first mandarin speaking prime minister and the whole country <laughs> fell over itself like it was like a horse playing the cello or something like it just <laughs> i i i just think yeah personally i would like to keep working to the goal where um fluency in a second language particularly of our new neighbors is um it's just an assumed requirement of, of high public office uh, and particularly of those of our chief, you know, neighbours and trading partners. So I'll, I'll shut up. All right, I'll do it. I'll come back to you in a second, but Andrew, you've had your hand up, so I'll just give the last question to you unless there are any burning questions in the room. Okay, okay, Andrew, last question, then we'll, um, Melissa, you can jump in. Okay, it's not a question, it's just a comment on the AFMLTA's report on, for a national strategy and plan for languages education in schools. And of course, we're encompassing all languages. But what the uh, research data identified, of course, was that there's a real workforce issue in Indonesian. There is an age issue, there's a proficiency issue. Um, and of course, there's a, a decline in program. So opportunity issue is uh, there as well. But workforce planning uh, is going to be really critical. And if, if there's one contribution that in Indonesia could possibly make, it might be to collaborate with us in the um, uh, provision of uh, young bilingual, um, yeah. you know, yeah. well trained teachers uh, coming in uh, to fill that void uh, if. Um, some of the strategies that have been pointed out here today are made available. If we're going to increase programs, we have to suddenly increase the range of uh, well-qualified contemporary um, representations of Indonesian language and culture in our classrooms. And, and without that, 
uh, where uh, there's going to be a bottleneck that's that would take you know, a few years to overcome. I think that's critical. The loss of Indonesian uh, language and studies in universities is, you know, one of the great impediments, uh, but the proximity of Indonesia and the uh, effectiveness of um, collaboration with Indonesia may well help, help fill that void. Thank you. Melissa, I'll just send you any last comments. Yeah, just very brief to respond to a question in the chat by Lisa on competing with Confucius Institutes. Um, the short answer is you soon may not need to. Um, my understanding is that many um, Australian universities uh, receive US State Department uh, funds. Last year, I think the US State Department made a condition that if you receive those funds as a university, you cannot have a Confucius Institute. So in 2023, supposedly there is going to be a deadline for Australian universities in terms of whether they continue to apply for and receive US State Department funds or whether they keep their Confucius Institute. At least that was the last that I heard. So uh, maybe watch out for more in that space. Yeah. Yeah. Great, well just before we thank our two speakers, I'll remind everybody of our next month uh, mid-seminar. It will be coming to us from two speakers in Germany, from uh, Wayne Palmer and Archa Mispa, and they'll be talking on employment protection and foreign migrants who work in Indonesia. So again, a really interesting topic. But uh, please join me in thanking Melissa and Liam. Um, Mubarak Ramadan. We're those of us not fasting here or have something, and then the rest of you, uh, happy Buka Puasa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Hopefully, see you next month. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks.